So, last lesson, we looked at terror through the uh, secret police, the Gestapo concentration camps, as one method of Nazi control, alongside the fact that the Nazi regime, and Hitler in particular, were, was actually, were actually quite popular amongst some sections of the German population. Obviously, not amongst those sections they were persecuting. So, there are two elements of control. Say. One, propaganda, and the other, terror. And by propaganda, this is control of culture and the mass media, uh, which can influence people. It, it can help to con not control directly, but it can influence their actions, influence their feelings and, and their support towards the regime. So what do we mean by propaganda? It isn't simply just lies. I mean, some propaganda is outright lies uh, in order to change beliefs and attitudes. It, it's, however, it, it's more complicated than that. There may be existing beliefs, existing prejudices, which will be reinforced by focus on that theme and, and repetition. Um, it, can, it can be lies, it can be half-truths, or, or truths out of context. By the way, you'll find all three of these things uh, very frequently on the internet. Uh, as I said, all three. So, what were the purposes of Nazi propaganda, of controlling culture and mass media? Well, one of the Nazi aims was Volksgemeinschaft, a unified national community of Germans, obviously not including what they regarded as undesirables, uh, working together for the common goals of the Nazi party to so make Germany great and ultimately, uh, according to what Hitler's desires and the Nazi party, to make Germany ready for war as well. Uh, so what do I mean by those Nazi values? They want to reshape beliefs values and ideas, such as the idea of racial purity. So here you actually have a children's book. You know, it looks familiar in that sense as a children's book, except it has a gross racist caricature of a Jewish person here. Uh, and so, uh, right from children's books, through every avenue of culture, uh, Nazi ideas were propagated and there was censorship and control. This idea of racial purity, national solidarity, it linked to this idea of the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, all Germans working together, and trust in Hitler's leadership. You can see that uh, in this poster, Hitler is presented as an almost mystical saviour of Germany in a sort of quasi-religious way, an almost Christ-like figure. So let's have a look at purposes of Nazi propaganda in terms of restructuring values, ideas and belief. So we've already said the solidarity. Solidarity means working together for the same purpose of the national community. Remember, the national community only means Aryan Germans. They do, in, in some senses, it's supposed to be egalitarian in that it's supposed to reduce uh, separations of class, culture, re religion and region and have Germans working together. As we said, of course, not including what the Nazis regarded as undesirables. And, um, in that same vein, the need for racial purity, the Nazi had this distorted idea of Darwinianism in which they believed there was a racial struggle and in order to be strong they needed a so-called pure race. Biological nonsense of course, as we've already explored, but that was the belief. And focusing hatred of enemies both outside Germany and within Germany, so that again would be uh, ideas of this uh, international Jewish conspiracy, or the unfair um, victors at Versailles. Trust, again, in Hitler's leadership. Um, Hitler being popular whilst his foreign policy is reasonably successful and it seems that Germany is recovering. Um, and, yeah, sorry, it's a, it's a central uh, part of the propaganda. It's the so-called Führer Prinzip. Hitler as a sort of almost a father of Germany, belief in him in that way. And the building of this new, as we said, Nazified society as a fighting community to prepare Germany and German citizens psychologically, prepare them to mobilise for war. Mobilise means get ready, not only your army and increasing weapons, but the population as well to prepare them for war in order to increase production and keep up their fighting spirit and morale. Um, oh, I bet you already said that one, yeah. Okay, let's move on. So looking at control of culture. Um, Goebbels, uh, you're probably already aware of this, Goebbels, a very key figure, appointed in 1933 as head of the Reich Chamber of Culture and Ministry for Propaganda 
and enlightenment. Um, it controlled basically everything. Uh, these were all the media of the time, newspapers, uh, movies, uh, visual arts, uh, the radio. The radio was a very influential mass media of the time. Uh, literature, so if you wanted to have your books or stories published, the theatre and music, all of these, in order to have your work heard or published, you had to be a member of the Reich Chamber of Culture. And you had to be a Nazi supporter in order to be a member of the chamber. So you've got a lot of control going here. And if you're not a member of the chamber, you're not going to get your work performed or published. Um, this actually here is an odd figure in many ways. Uh, this is Lenny Riefenstahl, who produced the film Triumph of the Will, a Nazi propaganda film. In many ways, actually, a very visionary and effective filmmaker. A lot of film techniques that she pioneered are actually sort of used in film schools today, to, uh, in, in the history of film. And in another way, rather unusual, as a woman who's actually a very influential figure. This goes against the Nazi ideals of women being at home in the kitchen. But nonetheless, it's a shame that her talent was used in the service of such a, an odious, horrifying regime. So the other half of it is censorship, uh, publications, newspapers, etc. They're only going to carry the Nazi version of events and any publications, any left-wing publications or publications which are follow an independent line, they're simply shut down. 1,600 newspapers by the end of 1934. There were a lot of regional newspapers back then, I guess as there are now actually as well. 10,000 magazines and journals as well. Of, of those 10,000 magazines and journals, half of them disappeared because they obviously they didn't tow the Nazi line. And here's an example of a magazine uh, only gave the Nazi point of view, so a very one-sided point of view. Literature, uh, Germany has a, a fine history of uh, great writers such as Goethe and others, but uh, some were not recognised by the Nazi party as being German. And so there were organised book burnings of Jewish authors, or anybody basically, who might be deemed to be unsympathetic to the Nazis or to Nazi ideals. It's a shame actually, because in many ways you think of students being progressive and trying to change the world in an idealistic way, or perhaps that's my misapprehension. But in May 1933, 20,000 books burned by Berlin students who were eager supporters of Nazi ideology. Uh, some of Germany's most famous authors, and two and a half thousand books were banned. Here you can see a picture of the, the book burning going on. Never a good thing when books are being burned, I think. Uh, the radio. This was uh, really very much part of the mass culture of the day, and it was very, very modern. It's difficult today in our age of uh, mobile phones and, uh, and, the, and internet uh, access it, instantly to imagine a time uh, before that. But the radio was really, that was the, the new modern multimedia of the day. Quite an expensive device as well. In 1932, four and a half million radios in Germany. Um, Hitler gave 50 speeches in that first year, so Germans could tune in uh, in the evening, families gathered together to hear Hitler's speeches. Obviously, Germans owning a radio are going to hear more of Hitler's speeches. So by 1942, over 16 million radios are present in German households. Well, how has that been achieved? Sets are placed in factories and cafes as well. Loudspeakers in the streets to carry Hitler's speeches and Nazi messages. It was really the first totalitarian state to use the radio itself as a propaganda tool. And what they did is they brought out very cheap, very affordable radio sets, people's radios. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and probably murder the pronunciation of this German word, Volkschimpfanger. Apologies to any German speaker. But basically, it's people's receivers or people's radios, brought out very cheap, deliberately, so every family could afford one. And when poorer Germans generally didn't have radios before 1933, well, they had one now, and as well as listening to entertainment, they could listen to Nazi propaganda. Music, Jewish composers, unsurprisingly banned. Jazz was also banned. It was seen as a black American uh, artistic musical form. Um, what, what was allowed, uh, apologies for this hideous racist poster here, um, what was allowed, uh, traditional uh, German uh, composers such as Strauss Wagner, he was a particular fan of Wagner who produced heroic German operas, I do actually quite like some of Wagner's music, although when you look at this, uh, 
look at this picture of this, well, it sort of looks uh, slightly silly and pompous at the same time, but some quite stirring music. It's a shame because it is certainly my opinion that it, when cultures mix and, and musical and artistic forms and cultural forms mix, that's when you get really great stuff happening. But the Nazis with their, their idiotic views on purity didn't see that. So, cinema. Um, here do you see a, 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 a movie, a Nazi movie? Well, they made lots of movies. Uh, and again, movie was, that really was a, a mass media event. You, you, they didn't have television sets, uh, in, in, certainly in Germany at the time. And so going to the movies was a very, very regular thing. Much higher attendance in the cinema than there is today. Not only in Germany, but around the world. Uh, attendance over 59 million in 1933. And the Nazis were in control of the film industries. Pumped out 100 films a year. Um, not all of them directly propaganda. Some comedies, some love stories. Oh, well, why might you think that? I mean, why wouldn't they have a relentless 100% propaganda? Well, they are quite sophisticated at propaganda, the Nazis. And they know that if they just pump out just pure propaganda, people are going to get bored of it. So they pump out things to keep people entertained. Especially, you know, it, when the sacrifices are being demanded of Germans to produce more in the factories or in the conditions of wartime. So you've got comedies, love stories, musicals and thrillers. And the other sort of quarter are going to be glorious military or political themes to sort of stir up patriotic feelings. Films about, for example, Frederick the Great. A movie about Frederick the Great was actually uh, produced during the war and they actually took soldiers away from the front line to act as extras. I certainly would have volunteered for that. As well as films aimed at the young. Again, you've got this story here. This is the, the, the heroic Hitler youth uh, who's actually murdered and it's seen as something of a tragedy and has a political message. So in summary, we looked at the nature of propaganda. It's a mixture of lies, half-truth and truth out of context. Uh, the purpose of it, to inculcate, to indoctrinate the ideal of the Nazi uh, national community of Germans and uh, hatred of enemies within Germany and without. Uh, controlling of culture, every aspect of culture, from radio to movies to art. <clears throat> Censorship of those as well. Music and cinema, as we've already said, controlled. And I hope you found that useful and made some notes.